Hello, everyone. In this lecture, I will go over the deeper Christian meanings in C.S. Lewis's The Lime, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. For this video, I'm going to sort of take for granted that you're familiar with the book or at least have seen the movie so I can move a little more quickly and look again at those deeper meanings. Now, before I start, I want to make it clear that according to Lewis, Aslan is not a simple allegory for Christ. This is not meant to be a one-to-one. -one. Rather, C.S. Lewis said, it's a supposal. I wondered, what if the second person of the Trinity, God the Son, were to be incarnated not only in our world, but in Narnia, a magical world of talking animals, living streams, and walking trees? What might he be? And as it turns out, the second person of the Trinity, God the Son, perhaps would have been Aslan, the Lion King. And so kind of keep that in mind as we go through this. This is not like the Pilgrim's Progress, a simple allegory, but how might the gospel work itself out in the land of Narnia? Now, hopefully you know that four children from our earth, Peter, Susan, Edmund, and Lucy Pevensey, all are ushered in to the magic land of Narnia. And they have dinner with the beavers where they begin to learn about Aslan. And when Mr. Beaver says that name again, the children say, who is Aslan? And he says, why don't you know? Don't you know? He's the king, the king of all these woods, though not here often, you know, never in my time nor in my father's time have we seen him. But the word is out that Aslan is on the move and is almost here. And then Edmund, who had been to Narnia earlier and met the evil white witch who has a wand that she can use to turn people to stone, and she's used the evil magic of her wand to make it always winter, but never Christmas. When he hears this, he says, well, if Aslan comes, won't the queen turn him to stone with her white wand? And Mr. Beaver says, Lord love you, son of Adam. Why, if she can look at him in the eye without her knees shaking, that's more than I expect of her. No, no, when Aslan comes, he'll set all things to right. As it says in a rhyme in these parts, wrong will be right when Aslan comes in sight. At the sound of his roar, sorrow will be no more. When he bears his teeth, winter meets its death. And when he shakes his mane, we shall have spring again. You'll understand better when you meet him. But the children are still confused. Who asked that? Is he a man? Man, Lord love you. Don't you hear what I'm saying? He's the king, the king of all the woods, the, em the son of the emperor beyond the sea. Don't you know the king of the woods in? Aslan is a lion, the lion, the great lion. And then Susan gets nervous and says, well, I, I don't know if I, if I want to meet a real lion. I mean, is he safe? Safe? Of course he isn't safe. He's a lion. But he's good. And then Peter says, I'm longing to meet him, Mr. Beaver. And Mr. Beaver says, so you shall. Because you see, there's another rhyme in these parts, time out of mind, that when Adam's flesh and Adam's bone sits at Care Paravel and throne, the evil times will be over and done. Now let's pause and look at some of the deeper meanings here. First of all, I love the fact that there are at least two prophecies, one about Aslan and one about the children that are coming together in this culminating moment. And you need to understand that in the Bible, Jesus fulfills dozens and dozens of prophecies from the Old Testament. They all come together and meet in the incarnation, and then the crucifixion, and then the resurrection. If I can borrow some lines from my favorite Christmas carol, O Little Town of Bethlehem, the hopes and fears of all the years are met in Narnia tonight. So we need to see the importance of how the coming of Aslan has been anticipated. Yes, the White Witch has held Narnia in winter for a hundred years, but there have been promises and prophecies and yearnings and anticipations, and they're coming together at this moment. No human could have planned it. 
but there's a greater purpose and a greater weave and it's all coming together and it cannot be stopped. Notice that when Aslan comes, wrong will be right. Everything's out of whack. We live in a broken, fragmented world. But when God comes into our world, he will set things right. He will restore things to the way that they should be. Notice that he is a lion, and because he's a lion, he isn't safe, but he's good. Too often, Lewis felt, we want to domesticate Jesus, make him nothing more than Jesus, meek and mild. But Lewis hoped that when people met Aslan, they would feel what he liked to call the numinous, that sense of joy and yet terror at the same time. And that is what's provoked. We can't domesticate him. We can't make him simple. He is good and loving and merciful, but he's a lion. He is God himself. And we should come to him with a sense of reverence and awe. And he tries to capture that in that famous phrase, not a tame lion, but he is good. And I think our age needs to be reminded of this even more than C.S. Lewis's age, that he is, again, wild and cannot be domesticated. Well, if you know the story, you'll know that when Edmund hears this, he sneaks out and he goes to the White Witch to betray his children, his siblings, and tell them that Aslan is on the move. And so Mr. Beaver and Mrs. Beaver take the three remaining children, Peter and Susan and Lucy, and they head out to a place called the Stone Table where they are going to meet with Aslan. And as they meet him, they look at him for the first eye, for a, for a moment. And Lewis says that for a moment, they stared at him. But as they saw his golden mane and his deep, royal, solemn, overwhelming eyes, they found they could no longer look at him and went all trembling inside. And for the first time, they realized that something could be beautiful and terrible at the same time. Again, he's not a tame lion. He's not safe. He cannot be domesticated. And we need to restore that sense of the numinous that we can be in the presence of God and feel joy, but also feel terror, awe in the old sense of that word. And Aslan notices that Edmund is not with them and is told that Edmund has betrayed them to the white witch. And Lucy says, please, Edmund, please, Aslan, can't you do anything to help our brother Edmund? And Aslan says, all will be done, but now it may be more difficult than you can imagine. And so treachery has come to Narnia. Just as in our world, we ate of the fruit of the knowledge of good and of evil. We betrayed our maker who only gave us one rule. Well, Edmund, by betraying his siblings and also betraying Aslan, has brought a kind of deceit into the world that is going to have terrible repercussions. And to fix it, it will be harder than you can imagine. Now, meanwhile, the white witch is trying to get to the stone table first, but she doesn't get there because when Aslan arrives and when Father Christmas arrives, her hundred years of winter begins to melt and her sleigh sort of guts in the grass and can't move forward. And so she walks the rest of the way. And as she's walking, she comes upon a group of party animals. Now, when I say that, I don't mean a bunch of frat boys. I mean literally a group of talking animals who are having a party. They're drinking and they're eating and they're having great merriment that hasn't been seen in Narnia for a hundred years. And when the witch sees them, she says, What is the meaning of all this gluttony, all this waste, all this self-indulgence? Who gave you these things? And when the animals insist that it was Father Christmas and will not say no, she waves her wand and turns them to stone. Folks, in the same way that I think many of us 
have lost an understanding of goodness, that goodness is merciful and loving, but it's also holy and just in the same way that we've forgotten that Christ is not a tame line, I think we've also mixed up our understanding of good and evil. We have this crazy notion that the devil is the one who wants us to have fun and party and go, and Jesus is the one who wants to put us into a box and make us all into little cookie cutter Christians. Many of you may have grown up thinking that it's Jesus who would say, what is the meaning of this gluttony and self-indulgence? But it's not. It's the enemy that wants to crush all of our joy. There's a verse in John chapter 10, that's the parable of the good shepherd, where Jesus says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, but I come that you might have life and have it to the full or have it abundantly. And we need to understand in the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe, Lewis wants us to see that it is the witch who steals and kills and destroys and wants to basically suck out our life and our personality and our joy. But it's Aslan, it's the Christ of Narnia who wants to bring joy and hope and life. Did you know that Satan means something in Hebrew? It means accuser. Satan is the one who accuses and would crush us but Christ is our advocate who stands in the gap and will will save us from the accuser. Well, Aslan and the good guys are able to save Edmund and restore him, but the white witch shows up, and when she comes, she points to Edmund and says, Aslan, you have a traitor in your midst. And Lewis says it would have been terrible for Edmund, but Edmund had stopped thinking about himself. He just kept looking at Aslan, who was his advocate, who was not the accuser. But the witch accuses again, and Aslan says, what is it to you? His treachery was not against you. What? Are you saying you've forgotten the deep magic? Let us say that I have. Remind us of it. What? What? You alone, Aslan, know the deep magic that the emperor put in Narni at the beginning. You know that the blood of every traitor belongs to me and that for every treachery I have a right to a kill. And if I do not get it, all Narnia will perish in fire and in water. And then Aslan says something the good characters aren't expecting. And he says... It is very true what you say. I do not deny it. And Susan says, isn't there something you can work against the emperor's magic? And Aslan says, work against the emperor's magic? And no one made that suggestion again. We need to understand that God is a God of justice and holiness. He can't just wave his hand and do away with it. In the Bible, the punishment for sin is death. And God cannot just wave those consequences away or he would be a tyrannical God who did not heed his own rules. Well, according to the deep magic, well, it's the same thing. The wages of sin are death, that the blood of every traitor belongs to the white witch. And so, as shocking as this sounds, the white witch has a righteous claim to the life of Edmund. She herself is not righteous, but her claim is, to a certain extent, Satan has a righteous claim on our blood because of our sin, but Satan is not righteous. But God follows his own rules. He understands that sin can't just be brushed under the carpet. It brings a fragmentation and a brokenness that needs to be fixed, but that fixing calls for extreme measures. So Aslan goes aside with the white witch and they make a deal and then Aslan says, the witch has released her claim on Edmund's life, but come, we have to leave this place, the place where the stone table is and we must go move our camp. And off they go. 
And then there is great rejoicing and Aslan gives them a feast. But Susan and Lucy notice that as the night progresses, Aslan seems to be heavier and sadder and more melancholy. And because of that, the girls can't sleep. And that night they go out to get a breath of fresh air and they see something that shocks them. They see Aslan, his head bowed low, going down the road that leads back to the stone table. Oh, Aslan, what's wrong? What's wrong? Are you ill? And Aslan says, oh, children, children, you should not be here. Still, I would be glad of company on a night like this. But you must promise me that when I tell you to stop, you will stop there and you will not make a sound. And they agree and they walk together. But as they walk again, Aslan seems heavier and more melancholy and his head bowed low. And at one point he trips and stumbles and almost falls. And Lucy says, oh, Aslan, Aslan, are you well? Are you sick? I am not ill, Lucy. I am only sad and lonely. Girls, put your hands in my mane that I might feel them there. And the girls who always wanted to do that but would never do it without permission buried their hands in the gold warm mane of Aslan. This whole scene is meant to capture the sorrow and sadness of Gethsemane and the, with the sorrow of what we call the Via Dolorosa, the way of sorrow as Jesus made his way to the cross. And many times as Jesus went to the cross, he stumbled and almost fell so that someone else had to carry his heavy cross. And, um, uh, and what, what, what Lewis is trying to help us to do is to feel the heaviness of that night. When Jesus prayed at the Garden of the Gethsemane, he prayed so uh, with, with such anguish that, that he began to sweat blood, which can actually happen if you're in such anguish that capillaries break and you can sweat blood. And Lewis wants us to re-experience the loneliness and sadness. Well, he gets to the stone table, which is the place where sacrifices are done. And he tells the girls to hide and he goes ahead. And the stone table is now filled with horrible creatures, witches and warlocks and, and, and minotaurs and all evil hags and terrifying things. And as Aslan walks in their midst, they're terrified of him. But when they see that Aslan is not resisting, that he is coming, to quote the Bible, as a lamb to the slaughter. They push him over, they tie him up, they put a muzzle on his face, and they begin to drag him to the stone table where the white witch is standing. But she says, stop! First let him be shaved. And then they come out with the scissors, cut, 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 till all his golden mane is gone. And then those hags and warlocks, when they see him, they go, why, why, look at him. He's nothing but a big cat. Why were we afraid of him? Have you caught any mice, snookums? Would you like a saucer of milk? And they began to beat him and cut him and, and, and spit on him and bite him. And then when their fury was finished, they dragged him up onto the stone table. And then the witch removed a stone knife and said, Aslan, you fool. So the deep magic will be fulfilled. As we agreed, you will die in Edmund's place and so fulfill the deep magic. But Aslan, once you are dead, what's to stop me from killing Edmund? What's to stop me from killing them all? Know this, Aslan, you have not saved Edmund or yourself, and you have given Narnia into my hands. In that knowledge, despair and die. And she drove her stone knife into Aslan, killing him. Now let's talk about this scene because Lewis is helping us to re-experience the horror of Good Friday, but in a different way. He doesn't 
overemphasize the actual killing. It happens so quickly. And too often, especially if you're evangelical like myself, all we ever think about when we think about Good Friday is the pain of crucifixion. And this is often true for Catholics as well, where, where they have crucifixes, where we fixate so much on the pain. And folks, the pain of crucifixion is terrible. I'm sure some of you have heard those sermons where they explain how terrible it is where you die of asphyxiation as you hang on those nails. It is the most excruciating way to die. And in fact, the word excruciating means out of the cross. But I believe that if Jesus were here and we asked him what was the worst part of Good Friday, he wouldn't say the physical pain. That only lasted for about six hours. And you probably know that our body doesn't remember physical pain. The proof of that is that women have a second child, okay? Our body, but there is something our body never forgets. If you were a child and your father chewed you out and told you you were useless and he was ashamed of you and wish he had another son, if that happens to you when you're a child, you never forget that. If that happened to me and I sat here and I tried to remember and recollect it, you would watch my face get, get red. You would see me start to cry. You would see me sweat. I would re-experience it. What I'm trying to get at here is that pain is a terrible thing, but much worse is emotional pain and angst. I believe that if Jesus were here, he would say the worst part of Good Friday was the betrayal, the rejection, people humiliating him, people embarrassing, spitting on him. His own father turned his face away and Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I learned something when I watched the Narnia movie with my children when they were very, very young. My daughter was only five. And after she watched that terrible crucifixion scene, I looked at her and said, was that terrible to watch? And she thought the most terrible part was not the killing, but she kept saying again and again, I can't believe they cut his hair. As a little girl, she understood intimately, viscerally, the shame of having her hair shorn off. And she could feel that for Aslan. And that's what C.S. Lewis wanted. If you grow up in the church, you've heard the story so many times, it becomes second hat. Lewis said, I wanted to strip away the stained glass and Sunday school associations so that we could experience that story again in all of its power and all of its terror. And that's what we see, putting a muzzle on him, humiliating him, the despair he must have felt, thinking for a moment perhaps that all of it was in vain. So, he is replaying Golgotha, the, the, the place of the skull where Jesus was killed. But again, he's allowing us to feel it afresh in a more vivid way. Well, after the witch ran off to prepare for the battle to take over all Narnia, Susan and Lucy come there weeping and weeping and they take off the muzzle and they wipe down the dead body, and they weep. And Lewis said they cried and cried until they had no more tears. And Lewis said, I hope none of you have ever been as miserable as Susan and Lucy were. But if you have been, you will know that after all of the tears, there comes a strange calm, as if nothing could ever happen again in the world. That's the way Susan and Lucy felt. Lewis takes us right to the cross to Mary Magdalene and the women who came to tend to the dead Christ and the despair they must have felt. And in their despair, they walk away and they walk back and forth until the very beginning of dawn when the first ray of the sun breaks across the horizon. The girls hear a tremendous crack like a giant breaking a giant's plate. And they run down and say, oh, Aslan, Aslan, what's wrong? What's happened? And they go down and what they see is the stone table is cracked in half, two pieces, 
and the body of Aslan is gone. Oh no, they say, what is this? Is this more magic? And they hear, yes, it is more magic. And they turn and they see Aslan. He's not only alive again, his mane has been restored bigger and golder than before, more golden than before. And the girls are at first frightened. You're not a, you're not a, I'm not a ghost. Come, touch me, feel me. I am real. He has been resurrected to a new and nobler body. But Susan is still confused. But what does it mean? What does it mean? And Aslan explains, it means that though the witch knew the deep magic, there is a magic deeper still that she did not know. Her knowledge only goes back to the dawn of time. But if she could have peered into the darkness and stillness before time dawned, There she would have read a different incantation. Then she would have known that when a willing victim who has committed no treachery was killed in a traitor's stead, the stone table would crack and death itself would start working backwards. You see, the witch knew the deep magic, basically that the punishment for sin is death. But she did not know the deeper magic that when someone who was a willing victim gave their life, it would release a greater magic. And particularly if that person is God in human flesh and that greater magic would defeat death, would crack the stone table and death would work backwards. Now I want to focus on the image of the broken stone table because it's one of the most powerful symbols in the whole line, the witch in the wardrobe. What does that broken stone table represent? Well, on the one hand, it represents the stone in front of the tomb of Christ that was rolled away, right? The women who came to anoint the body were afraid. Who can move the stone first? It's take an army to move that stone. But when they come, the stone had been moved aside and the body of Christ was gone. So on the simplest level, it's that. On another level, because it's broken, it can never be used again. This is the end to blood sacrifice. Jesus is our high priest, and there's no need for a bloody sacrifice. It's been made an end to it. Once and for all, the final sacrifice was made. But there's two more deeper levels we don't want to miss. If you think about how that stone table was cracked from top to bottom, you might remember that when Jesus was crucified, a series of miraculous events happened. There was an earthquake. There was an eclipse of the sun. The tombs of the saints broke open and people saw the saints in the town. And one more thing, the veil in the temple was torn from top to bottom. That's a miracle because the veil in the temple was super, super thick. And the reason the veil was there was to cordon off the holy of holies or the most holy place. And it was holy because that's where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. The Ark of the Covenant where the very presence of God, of Yahweh, hovered over the Ark of the Covenant. Inside was kept (coughs) the Ten Commandments, a jar of manna and the, uh, bu- the, the, the staff of Aaron that budded, showing that he was indeed the priest of the priestly family. And during the time of Jesus, only one person was allowed in the Holy of Holies where the presence of God dwelled, and that was the high priest. But even the high priest could only go there one day a year on Yom Kippur, the high holy day, the day of atonement. And what happened is the priest, the high priest would go into the holy place before the presence of God and perform the sacrifice so that he could stand in the gap for not just individuals, but for the whole congregation of Israel. He would intercede for the sins of the people. It was during that festival that he would take his hands and put them on the head of a goat and ritually transfer the sins of the people onto the goat known as the scapegoat, and he would be sent out into the wilderness. And there would be another goat and bull that was sacrificed. But 
only the high priest was allowed. But when Jesus died, that was an end to sacrifice. And by ripping the veil and the curtain, it signified that now all people have direct access to the presence of God through the blood of Christ. We no longer need a high priest. The deep magic has been crushed and replaced by the deeper magic. But there's one more level of meaning. Think about those two pieces of the stone table. Do they remind you of something? Yes, the Ten Commandments, the tablets of the law. Now, we call the parts of our Bible the Old Testament and the New Testament. And that's accurate, but I wish we would stop doing that because nobody knows what the word testament means anymore. Well, testament means covenant. It's the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. The Old Covenant is between the Jews and God mediated by the law of Moses. But the New Covenant is between God and possibly all people mediated by the blood of Christ. And so in the Christian story, we go from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant. We go from law to grace or in Narnia, from the uh, deep magic to the deeper magic. And Jesus himself taught us to say this because at the Last Supper, he said, this is my blood of the New Testament. If you're reading the King James, or if you're reading a modern translation, this is my blood of the New Covenant. And that New Covenant, again, is mediated by the blood of Christ. And so the broken stone table sort of signifies all those things at the same time, helping us to understand. And Lewis was very enamored of what's called the ransom theory of atonement. The idea that to a certain extent, the devil owns us because of sin, but Christ, when he shed his blood on the cross or the stone table, paid the ransom to buy us back. And Lewis really believed in that. And that's why in his space trilogy, his trilogy of science fiction novels, his main character, the Christ figure, is called Ransom. Now, a lot of you have probably understood that basic notion and that we have a resurrection. But there's another part of Narnia. After Aslan resurrects, he goes with Susan and Lucy to the castle of the White Witch and the castle's full of statues because with her evil magic wand, she has turned giants and centaurs and satyrs and even, even trees has turned them to stone by her evil magic. But Aslan goes up to the statues one by one and he breathes on them and they become alive again. Now, what's going on? We can understand the resurrection when the stone table's broken and he is now, death works backwards. But what is Lewis saying with these stone statues coming to life? Well, you need to know that the same time he was writing The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, he was taking his broadcast talks and editing them for Mere Christianity. And so there's a lot of overlaps between Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe and Mere Christianity. And in Mere Christianity, Lewis explains that what does it mean to go from being a non-believer to a believer? What does it really mean to be born again, to find new life in Christ? And to help us understand it, Lewis explains there's two different words for life in Greek. There's bios, where we get biology, and bios is creaturely life, the life all living things have. And that's a good life, but it will eventually get sick, run down, and die. When Jesus healed people in Palestine, he gave them an injection of bios life. But eventually, all those people he healed died because just getting an injection of bios life is not enough. We need zoe life, Z-O-E. Zoe, the way Jesus uses it in the Gospel of John, represents God's eternal life the indestructible life that is in God, that is in the Trinity for all eternity. To become a Christian is to have your bios life killed and replaced 
with Zoe life, with the indestructible life of God. That's what new life in Christ means. I don't know if you noticed this, but it seems pretty clear that before Aslan died and rose again, he didn't seem to have the power to blow on statues, breathe on statues and make them come to life. But now that he's died and resurrected to a new life, he has the power to share that Zoe life, that resurrection life with anyone who will accept it. And that's why Lewis says in Mere Christianity, becoming a Christian is not like a nice person becoming a really nice person. It's more like a statue coming to life. Now, I want to illustrate quickly. In the Gospels, see, uh, Jesus brings three people back from the dead. Lazarus, the daughter of Jairus, and the son of a widow. And I want to explain to you how that works by using this bag on which I've written the word death, which is probably backwards to you. My lunch wasn't that bad, but this bag represents death. Now, when Jesus healed Jairus' daughter, she was only dead for a few hours. So imagine that Jesus has reached in and pulled her out of the lip of the bag. But the widow's son mentioned in Luke was dead about a day. They were taking him to be buried. And so imagine he's fallen to the center of the bag, but still, Jesus reaches into the center of the bag and pulls him back out. But then there's Lazarus, dead four days in the tomb, his body already beginning to decay. He's fallen to the bottom of the bag. But the long arm of Jesus reaches in and pulls him out and restores him to life. But what about the resurrection of Christ? How am I going to illustrate that? I've run out of bag. Well, this is how I illustrate that. Hey, Jesus didn't die and come back. Jesus went through death and came out on the other side. And that's what Aslan has done. He's defeated death. He's gone through death and come out on the other side. And now he can share that life with anyone. One of Jesus's promises says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Lo, I am with you even to the end of the age. Well, we can promise our family that we will try to come back to them, but we can't promise 100% because we have control over our moral ethical decisions. We can stay true to our vow and come back, but we have no ultimate control over our life. If we're run over on the street, we can't fulfill our promise. But folks, Jesus, like Aslan, the Christ of Narnia, has been through death and defeated it. And so nothing can stop him. When he says he is with us always, he is with us always, and he cannot be stopped. That's the new and greater Zoe life that Aslan comes to, and it's what he breathes on the statues to bring them to life.